Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri, in the USA. This is part two of our TRS-80 Model 4P restoration series. In this video, we're going to refurbish the original Tandon five and a quarter inch floppy drive. We'll then set about to make a bootable floppy and test this thing out. If everything goes well, we'll add another 64K to bring this beast up to 128 big Ks. Well, what do you say we jump right in and see how it goes? Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. They do circuit boards of all sizes, small circuit boards, medium circuit boards. They can even assemble them for you. Head on over to PCBWay.com and check out their 8th anniversary promotion. They have coupons, a sale, and even a drawing. Be sure to take note of all the services they offer circuit boards, flex boards, 3D printing, even CNC machining at PCBWay.com. I pulled the five and a quarter floppy drive out of the frame. Uh, this is a tannin drive. It is uh, kind of a pre-PC type of drive. It's what was used before IBM did the PCs and IBM did things a little differently and all together this looks pretty clean there's a little crud on the main pulley here just from having the belt stuck there for years I'm guessing so we'll see if we can't slip this belt off and take care of that and We'll need to pull the circuit board out of the way to get to the rails to clean and lube them and clean the head. I guess we can start with this belt. The belt isn't stretched. This kind of looks like one of those fiber reinforced belts, which tend to hold up better with the passage of time. I'll try a little alcohol here. Get to a spot on the belt which has some of the nastiness on it and just give it a wipe that seems to be doing okay well all this fooling about I've almost accidentally got the belt off of here which is not what I was after There's some more gross stuff on it. That's doing a fair job of cleaning that stuff off the belt. Might give it another go around and then we'll do the same thing on the pulley here. Turn it around a little more and look what I found. Another stink bug. Right in the trash he goes. There had to be at least half a dozen of them in this thing. Fun, fun, fun. Well, I got the belt and pulley cleaned up, but trying to get this belt back on here is proving to be difficult. Um, the pulley is pretty well shrouded. And I don't want to take things too far apart and mess up the alignment. So I'm hoping if we get the circuit board out of here, we'll be able to see a little under this side. I've marked these connectors and the sockets where they go. Since they're not keyed, I also took pictures. It's always a good idea. And it looks like there's just the two screws on the tail end of this board. And you need to 
pull it up and out. Oh, I'm a big dummy. It's got this whole row of connectors right here. I bet you guys were looking at that, screaming at me. So take one more picture. Label these myself. One, two, three. There we go. Now. That's actually a separate little connector there. Okay, let's try this again. And yeah, there's a zip tie right here that's got to be undone. So we can slip that over that post. I just slip that over that post right there. Right there. That provided enough slack. Perhaps to unplug these. There we go. Okay. That slipped out of there like that. Got an insulating sheet here. Just one screw, no more bugs under here. And I can see a little more around the pulley, but this plate is in place. And that would m misalign a lot of stuff if I took it off of there. Okay, so gotta get this belt free. Well, <laughs> that's not exactly what I wanted to do, is it? Hmm. Okay, smart thinner, F-E-N-N-E-R. If we try to poke it in there like that, maybe use the spring hook to encourage it to wrap around here. Now, happens if I put the belt on the pulley in the right spot try to rotate it around just rotating this manually using the screwdriver to keep tension on the belt and it seems to be riding in the correct spot now so perhaps we can slip it back on the Motor. Yay. Okay. That was kind of a pain in the butt. It's still riding a little high from this angle on this pulley. So I'm just going to push it down and rotate it around. And on this side, everything looks okay. There's no bugs hiding in that little recess there. Or in the nooks and crannies that I can see. Now there is, I'm right here, the spring hook is pressing. You can see a little bit of gray there. 
That is a bit of foam. Four or five millimeters tall, maybe 20 millimeters long, four or five millimeters wide. Self-adhesive foam. Imagine that pushes down on the disc when it's closed. That seems to be in good shape. So I'm not going to try to pull this flap up and replace it. We'll turn our attention to the rails now. These rails are pretty clean, so I'm just going to wipe them with a dry Q-tip. Carefully slide the head back. Slide it all the way forward. And I've got just a bunch of lithium grease here. I know people used different things. This is very kind of similar to what was used from the factory on many drives. And you don't need much. So. I've also heard of some people using sewing machine oil. I'm going to take a clean Q-tip and kind of wipe up the excess. You really just need the lightest coating on there. Any excess might just fling off and get on something important. Freshly lubricated and working fine. Now I need to clean the head. This is a single-sided drive. Single-sided, I think about 180K formatted. Be similar to like, oh, the five and a quarter inch drives used by Atari and Commodore and whatnot back in the day. Okay, got her all cleaned up. Little schmaltz here on this insulator. Okay, so he goes back in there like that. Got our circuit board here. This all looks fine. Uh, there's a little dirt right here, which I'll clean off with the toothbrush and some alcohol. And then we'll slip this back in here and test it out. Here is our test setup for our Tandon drive. This is my perpetually unfinished SuperCard Pro uh, setup. Um, I don't have it all finished, so I've got an external power supply, yada yada. I'm using the cable from the 4P um, I've got it plugged into the SuperCard Pro with the first connector here, which should be drive zero. And I've got the SuperCard Pro running. You can see it up on the screen right now. And what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll pop a floppy disk in this guy. And we can see right away it's running. And I don't know if I can get closer in there so you can see the drive a little better or not. There we go. Okay. Now, with the SuperCard Pro software, I can do a maximum track test, which is going to run the head back and forth. And it'll tell us the maximum track it can reach is track 42. Okay. A 40 track drive, so that's pretty good. And then we can, knowing that, we can set our setting here. So we're only going to track 42. Actually, we can do track 40. We don't need to test past that. And we can do stuff like a drive speed test. Right at 300 RPM. That's pretty good. We don't need to adjust that. We could do a disk media test where it is going to write and read from the disk 
a little bit on each track just to make sure that the disc appears good. And this also is a nice test of the drive reading and writing as well. And of course this is a single sided drive so where it says head one you can ignore that. It's not really doing anything there. And you can just see right here the SuperCard Pro data LED blinking as it's doing its magic. The drive is nice and quiet. Appears to be doing a good job. And it says all tracks are good. To the casual observer, this might look like a TRS-80 Model 4P that is booted off the original floppy drive. But to the highly trained vintage computer technician, it's a, well, it's a TRS-80 Model 4P that's booted off the original floppy drive. But the real story is how we got here and it wasn't a direct route. Let me explain. The path I would normally take for something like this is I would start with an image I found on the web in the left center and taking this upper path I would convert it to a SuperCard Pro format, a .scp file using the HXC software and then I would use the SuperCard Pro connected to the five and a quarter inch floppy drive to make a bootable floppy. But this did not work. There were problems with the way the SuperCard Pro was converting the image file and there was also a problem with the way that the SuperCard Pro software was interpreting the image file. It kind of reminded me of when I first moved to Missouri. I would ask my boss how to get somewhere and he would say, well, you can't get there from here. So go this way instead. And that's kind of what I had to do here. I had to take this lower route where I loaded that image onto a GoTech, booted the computer from that image, and then used the DOS on the computer to make a backup copy onto the actual floppy drive. Then I was able to hook the floppy drive back to the SuperCard Pro and create a SuperCard Pro image from it. Well, that's kind of a long and convoluted way around, but I eventually got there. And if you don't happen to have a SuperCard Pro or Chiroflux or Grease Weasel or something like that, you can still find a disk image on the web and using your GoTech, you can write that to an actual floppy disk. It's just another way to get the same thing done. Those GoTechs are pretty handy little gadgets. Here is a demonstration of the process of going from an image running on the GoTech to making an actual floppy disk of that image. Now, I've got a uh, image here that's the Model 1 through 4 diagnostic disk. This is something that Radio Shack released back in the day. And I'll zoom in here on the screen and explain what I'm doing with the rest of this stuff. Here we are booted up to a TRS-DOS uh, 06.02.00. And it's kind of hard to see the characters down here in the corner. I've got to keep the board in uh, close proximity to the screen. Um, the first thing I'm going to do here is do a directory. And this is telling us the directory from the GoTech, which is set up as drive 0. Our floppy drive is connected as drive 1. And the name on this disk is TRS-DOS 62. Okay, and it's got a lot of files on it. Now I'm going to... Okay, yeah, the disk I have in one doesn't have anything on it, so it's telling us that. Now I'm going to format drive 1. And we will call it TRS DOS 62. Uh, no master password. It is single sided. Oh, excuse me. Double density. This is not side, it's density. Double density. Number of cylinders is 40. Depending on the version of DOS and how it might have been hacked over the years, uh, the standard format command may or may not be able to handle higher density drives. So I'm going through kind of the long method here to make sure it's trying to format this as 40 tracks. 
We'll hit enter. And there we go. Now we are formatting away. And it does a verify after the format. Okay, now we have a formatted disk. We can do a backup of colon zero, drive zero, to colon one, drive one, which is our floppy drive. And now it's busy backing up. And when it's done, we will have a bootable floppy disk. Now, our floppy disk is ready to go. It was at this point, after I had formatted and backed up from the GoTech to the floppy drive, that I hooked the floppy drive back up to the SuperCard Pro and made an image from the SuperCard Pro. With that image, I'm able to write back to a floppy disk using the SuperCard Pro. It was kind of a, a long route, long, you know, to get there, but we got there in the end. I think we'll set up this 4P with the GoTech as drive zero and the floppy drive as drive one. Now, I also have an image of a, a TRS-80 Model 1 to 4 diagnostic program that Radio Shack released back in the day. Let's go ahead and boot that up so we can give this RAM a better test. We've got the TRS-80 Model 1 through 4 diagnostics booted up off the GoTech, and I'm going to run the RAM test, and we'll see how this RAM's doing. Um, I will zoom you in here on the screen. If the original 64K RAM test out okay, remember we've already placed the one chip, um, I've got some more RAM we can put in to fill this out with all 128K, and then we'll test it again. Um, just to see what a failed RAM test looks like after we think it's all good, I'll put in the bad chip that I removed, and we'll see what sort of error we get. Let's jump in. Okay exposed a little more of the screen there so I think to run the RAM test we want D for drive and memory diagnostics and then floppy disk drive diagnostic disk drive alignment hard disk diagnostic hard disk reliability 16k memory diagnostic and 64K, 128K. Sometimes when I pull my finger away from there, I can make the screen jump. Um, so we want a two. And it runs the beeper, which is rather annoying. They call that the soundboard test and the soundboard is a speaker. Now it's filling the video RAM and it's telling us it's running at 60 hertz. Um, echo okay and LP bad. It's trying to test the parallel port, but I don't have the loopback dongle on there. And if it finds an error, it's supposed to write it out here. But since I think we have good RAM, we don't see anything. And for some reason, it's running the floppy drive the whole time while doing this. Which is not ideal. The, this diagnostics program is quite extensive. It has a diagnostic board and harness that you can plug in to test all the ports. Uh, that type of thing. So, I think this is okay. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the error listed will, you know, if there's an error, what it's going to tell us on the screen. It's not really explicit about that in the manual, other than saying it's going to give us the IC number and the address. I don't see anything like that up here. So uh, we'll go ahead and shut this off and I'll populate the... 
the second bank of RAM. There is a jumper right here, which needs to be switched from E2, E3 to E1, E2. And then we'll try it again. Okay, we should have 128K RAM now. So if we go D, um, or no, two. Now, oh, there we go. It was just thinking. Yep, it says 128K. I can hear a slight tick from the speaker every time the seconds count here and it's showing us we do have 128k installed and it's supposed to give us some type of other failure if any of the video ram is detected as bad otherwise it's just uh, changing what it's putting out to the screen okay i'm curious what the failure display looks like so i'm going to put in a bad ram chip and we'll try this again. Okay, bad RAM chip installed in bit 7 on the second bank. So if we press D and then 2, let's see what it does. We get the sound card test. Ah, yeah, error occurs at 94.20. Data should be zero is 80. Yes. All right, now we know what the error looks like. Excellent, we'll tell it to try again. Now it just starts the whole test over. Error in bank three, bad bits are seven. Yes, so it is telling us that it's bit seven, which is correct. Error occurs at 94.21, so it moved one address that time. And this bank number here, if you look at the memory map in the manual, it can, uh, the Model 4P can reconfigure its memory so it can mimic, like say, a Model 3, etc and it moves different parts of the RAM in and out to different address ranges to do that. So, yep, it's telling us what is bad. Now, it doesn't tell us the chip number, does it? That is U150, but it does say bit 7 and bank 3, so we can infer the uh, chip number from that. So now I'll shut this back off. We'll fire up the RAM test again with all good RAM in it, and I'll let that run for an hour or so. Well, I left this memory test running for about three hours, and it hasn't missed a beat. In fact, the only thing bad I can say about it at this point is that the cooling fan is a little loud, and that's kind of irritating. I'm not sure if there's much we can do about that, though. I did go ahead and I unplugged the floppy drive uh, since I was letting this run for so long. I'm not sure why they keep the motor running during this test, but, you know, I guess most people probably wouldn't run the memory test for three hours. At any rate, I think this is a good stopping point. In the next video, we'll get into the cosmetics part of it. We'll clean the case up really good, do some retro writing. Maybe we'll paint the GoTech uh, to match the rest of the machine. If you have any questions or comments, well, leave them in that comment section down there below. I would love to hear from you. Also, look in the description for links to any products I mention and service manuals and things like that. I always try to put them down there. Thanks to everyone who helps support the Hey Burt channel through Patreon and other means. You help keep this channel going. Uh, if you'd like some information about that, just look in the description down there below. Well, until next time. Bye.
Bye.